What's up, eco nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be looking at water pollution problems in lakes and streams. So streams and rivers around the world are extensively polluted, but they can cleanse themselves of many pollutants if we don't overload them or reduce their flows. And the addition of excessive nutrients to lakes from human activities can disrupt ecosystems and prevention of such pollution is much more effective and less costly than cleaning it up. So streams can cleanse themselves if we don't overload them. They do this through dilution and biodegradation of wastes by bacteria. However, it does take time and you also see an oxygen sag curve. So looking at this graphic right here, we have types of organisms that are indigenous to the environment whenever the water is clean. So we have normal clean water organisms such as trout, perch, bass, mayfly, and stonefly. The dissolved oxygen is approximately eight parts per million, and we have a very low biochemical oxygen demand. Then we have our point source, which is our source of pollution. So say from a wastewater treatment plant or sewage. So right here, this is our point source, the decomposition zone. Pollution tolerant fishes such as carp and gar can be found here. Then we move into our septic zone. This is when fish are absent. We see a lot of fungi develop. We have sludge worms, and we also have a lot of anaerobic bacteria that start appearing. And if you look right here, the dissolved oxygen curve has gone way down right here. And the biochemical oxygen demand has gone way up. So it starts decreasing eventually, and we get into our recovery zone. In the recovery zone, you see a steady decline of the biochemical oxygen demand and a steady incline of the dissolved oxygen parts per million. We start seeing pollution tolerant fishes again, such as the carp and the gar, and eventually we get into the clean zone, and you start to see normal clean water fish again, such as the trout, perch, bass, mayfly, and stonefly. So this would be an example of our dilution, the bacteria taking uh, control and naturally degrading the pollutants and eventually going back into our clean water source. But if we don't have a flow of water and it's not a large volume of water, that's going to get stuck into the position where the biochemical oxygen demand is going to remain high and the dissolved oxygen content is going to remain very low. So in the 1970s, there were water pollution control laws that were established, and there were many successful water cleanup stories, such as the Ohio Chihoyga River in the United States and the Thames River of Great Britain. Contamination of toxic inorganic and organic chemicals by industries and mines had caused these rivers to be extremely polluted, but people took initiative and they started to clean up the rivers and come up with different types of laws as well as ways of taking the pollutants out of the rivers. So this is a classic example of you matter, I matter. Everybody in the world and what they do matters and one person can make a difference. So one of those people was John Beale and he basically restored the Ham Creek of Seattle, Washington in the United States. He took a lot of initiative, he planted trees, he persuaded companies to stop dumping their toxins into the rivers, into the stream, and he also removed a lot of garbage from the stream himself. So looking at the global uh, outlook as far as stream pollution in developing countries, meaning developing countries such as China, India, uh, nations that aren't quite where the United States is. So unfortunately, over half of the world's 500 major rivers are polluted. Uh, they're polluted with untreated sewage, so people going to the bathroom and all of that feces and you know pollutants, all of those going into the water directly without any type of treatment. Industrial waste coming off of all of the factories, different types of plants uh, going directly again into the rivers and the streams. Um, Two of the large examples, again, are India and China's rivers. They're extremely polluted. They're toxic not only to the animals and plant life that live there, but as well as the humans that live around them. So the natural capital degradation, uh, this is an example of a very highly polluted river in China. So as you can see, not only is there a lot of garbage, but there's all kinds of algal blooms. Uh, there's going to be a lot of anaerobic bacteria found in the river as well. 
also heavy metals as far as uh, industrial pollution. A lot of times you're going to find a lot of heavy metals in those rivers as well. Uh, this is another example of humans polluting rivers and streams. This is a trash truck disposing of its garbage into a river in Peru. So obviously it's not dumping its garbage into a landfill that's been secured with linings and things like that to prevent the pollution from going into the water source. This truck is dumping its garbage directly into the water. So one of the effects is, you know, of pollution, biomagnifying, things like that, is too little mixing and very low water flow, and it makes lakes very vulnerable for water pollution. When we have streams and rivers, they can take care of themselves because they have a steady flow of water, um, water coming in, water going out. However, lakes are pretty much a sedentary body of water. There's not much going in and not much going out of the lakes. So they're a lot less effective at diluting pollutants than streams and rivers are. Lakes do have stratified layers, and there's very little vertical mixing that occurs. It does happen, but not very often. There's also little to no water flow. Pretty much the only water they're going to get is going to come from runoff, uh, precipitation in the form of you know, snow, sleet, rain, things like that. And it can take up to 100 years to change the water in a lake. And again, biomagnification of pollutants is a very common threat in lakes. So this is an example of a fish kill by water pollution. So a lot of times if a lake becomes very polluted, you'll see, or you're probably going to smell it before you see it, a huge fish kill. So you'll see all of these fish floating at the top of the water. Uh, you'll see them washed up on the shorelines. Uh, I've seen this, unfortunately, a couple of times in my life. And like I said, the one thing I remember the most, aside from the dead fish, was the smell of it before I even got there. It was just this horrible, horrible smell. So eutrophication, this is a natural process, but we can also have human-caused eutrophication. So naturally, uh, eutrophication is a natural enrichment of a shallow lake, estuary, or slow-moving stream. It's caused by runoff into the lake that contains nitrates and phosphates. And again, this is a natural runoff. This is not caused by runoff from farming industries and things like that. And then we have oligotrophic lakes. These are lakes that have very low amounts of nutrients and they have very clear water. So the more nutrients, the less clear the water is going to be, or I should say the more turbid the water is going to be. If the water is very turbid, it's going to have a lot of sediments. A lot of times you'll see huge algal blooms. It's going to be very cloudy. So if we have an input of nitrogen and phosphorus, again, you're going to see an algal bloom. The algal bloom occurs, the algae dies, and then it decays. This does lower the oxygen content of the area, though. We also have man-made eutrophication, which we call cultural eutrophication. Cultural eutrophication is caused by nitrates and phosphates from human sources, such as farms, feedlots, streets, parking lots, fertilized lawns, mining sites, as well as sewage plants. And during hot weather or droughts, you get huge algal blooms. And this also increases the number of bacteria in the water as well. And typically, it's going to increase the amount of um, anaerobic bacteria. And this leads to more nutrients, which leads to more bacteria, which leads to more algae. And it's basically this round and round and round we go, but the result is that the native species are basically going to die off. And again, an example of that would be the fish kill. So there's not enough oxygen in the lake. Uh, a lot of times the algae blooms, like I was saying, they can actually get clogged up in the fish's gills and prevent them from breathing. So what about preventing cultural eutrophication? What can we do? Well, to prevent it, we can remove nitrates and phosphates before they enter the water source. We can actually divert lake water, and we can clean the lakes up. We can remove excess weeds. We can use herbicides and algicides. But again, there's also a downside to that because we're putting more chemicals into the water source. We can also pump in air to try and increase the dissolved oxygen content of the water. So this is an example of cultural eutrophication in a Chinese lake. As you can see, there is a huge algal bloom. You can't even see water. If you looked at this picture and you didn't see the guy in a boat, you'd probably think this was some type of golf course because it's so green and there's so much plant life. But this is actually a lake. And again, 
it was caused because of an increased input of nitrates and phosphates into the body of water, which caused a huge algal bloom. Obviously, that decreased all of the oxygen content, so this probably is devoid of fish and other types of animal life. So going back to our original case study of Lake Washington in Puget Sound. So we had severe water pollution and we did realize that it could be reversed. So citizen action combined with scientific research helped to decrease the pollution of that lake. Uh, good solutions, however, don't always work forever. There's always different pollutants that are going to be coming in to the lake, which are going to cause more problems and we're going to have to come up with more solutions. So wastewater treatment plant effluents were sent to Puget Sound. So again, all of those nitrates, phosphates, the sewage, things like that, uh, that's going to be our effluents. So case study for the pollution in the Great Lakes. Well, in the 1960s, there were many areas with cultural eutrophication. And in 1972, Canada and the United States came up with the Great Lakes Pollution Control Program. And it worked. It was very effective. It decreased the number of algal blooms. It increased the dissolved oxygen content of the bodies of water. It increased fishing catches. The swimming beaches were reopened. There were better sewage treatment plants that were put into place. And there were fewer industrial wastes that were being released into the water. They also had bans on phosphate containing household products. But problems still exist. There was still raw sewage that was getting put in. Uh, there was non-point uh, sources of runoff and pesticides as well as fertilizers that were going into the lake. There were other types of biological pollution and we also had atmospheric deposition of pesticides as well as mercury. So in 2007 the state of the Great Lakes report basically came back and said that they found new pollutants that were being released into the lakes, that there was wetland loss and degradation meaning the wetlands were suffering, uh, they had a decline of some of the native species, so they're losing some of the native species of plants and animals. And they also had native carnivorous fish species that were declining. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about stream and lake pollution. If you'd like to rewatch this video lecture or any others for AP Environmental Science, you can visit my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.